A seemingly loving mother and father, while appearing normal to all of their friends and neighbors, kept their 13 kids locked away, shackled and chained, weak and starving, for almost 30 years. So how did this happen? How did it go on so long? And whatever happened to them? If you're looking to try something new this summer, then how about trying out some more interesting food for once? With HelloFresh, you can try out a variety of global flavors all from your own kitchen. HelloFresh offers a wide variety of all kinds of quick and easy recipes that take minimal prep time and don't require much cleanup afterwards. They also always come with clear, step-by-step -step instructions on how to cook the food and the ingredients are pre-proportioned so you don't have to count anything out. Not only that, but you end up with less trips to the store since it comes with every little thing you need. With HelloFresh, you have options for adding, swapping, or upgrading proteins each week. You can even add a protein to veggie dishes if you want to eat light but keep that protein gram count up. For today's video, I decided to try out the Firehouse Cheeseburgers. Not only was this the easiest one to make so far, but it was also one of the best tasting. It's the best burger I've ever made for myself, hands down. I wouldn't have ever even thought to really add ranch or hot sauce, so maybe that's on me, but hey, that's one of the benefits of HelloFresh. It's all here. This is a great way to cook at home for minimum effort and maximum output. Nobody likes blowing money on takeout every night or eating microwave banquet meals and stuff like that. Buffy. Not to mention that you'll cut down on time and you'll cut down on your food waste by about 25% as well compared to grocery shopping. So go to HelloFresh.com and use the code DIRETRIP16, all caps, all one word, for 16 free meals across 7 boxes and 3 free gifts. Again, don't forget to go to HelloFresh.com and use the code DIRETRIP16 for 16 free meals across 7 boxes and 3 free gifts. Today we have a big, whopping absurdity of a case. It's one of the strangest, but also one of the darkest and most disturbing cases I've ever heard of. So, to really do the story justice, let's start way back at the beginning with the childhoods of these two criminals. First off, we have David Allen Turpin. This is a man who was born way back on October 17th in 1961. It's said that he actually had a rather promising early childhood. It even seemed like he was going to do really well in life. During high school, he was an officer in the Bible Club. Not sure what that really entails. He was in the Chess Club, the Science Club, and even the Acapella Choir. While doing all of this, he never neglected his studies either. Those around him described him as kind of nerdy. Eventually, he went on to go to school at Virginia Tech, graduated, and went on to work for both Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman, locking down pretty good positions in both of these companies. Now, addressing the elephant in the room, you may notice that this man's style definitely makes him stand out. He certainly has a unique look to him that kind of became a spectacle later on. He met the woman, or rather, girl, he would go on to marry at Princeton High School in West Virginia. He was 23 and she was still 16. This girl was Louise Ann Turpin, and she didn't necessarily have as nice of a childhood as David. You could say that her upbringing was a downright toxic cesspool of abuse and neglect. Although her father was a supposedly religious man, a preacher in fact, when she was little, according to her sister Teresa, their mother would regularly sell the two girls to a wealthy older man she knew that would, well, do whatever he wanted to them. Life wasn't really necessarily any better for her at home, either. Most daily life revolved around trying not to make waves and covering her ears to drown out the sounds of her parents fighting. When she left home to go to school, she was routinely bullied there. Her parents were extremely strict as well, not allowing her to hang out with other kids, let alone date anyone. This is why Louise ended up dating David in secret. Before too long, she ran away from home to elope with him when she was still 16. David showed up at her high school and somehow was able to sign her out and take her with him. Pre-Columbine world, things just worked differently, I guess. They then ran off to Texas and seemed to be getting away with it until Louise's parents called the police and they were eventually tracked down. Louise's father wasn't really angry in the way you'd think, though. He was more angry because he wanted her to have a proper religious ceremony if she was to get married. The two were able to get married and they seemed to settle down. Being that they were both very strict Pentecostal Christians, they had a belief that they had a mission from God to be fruitful and multiply, i.e. having way too many babies. Hell, these people shouldn't have had any babies, but they went on to have ten daughters and three sons. 
In the 90s, they moved into a home near Fort Worth, Texas, and lived a pretty secluded life. Neighbors who lived near them at the time said that they rarely, if ever, interacted with any of their neighbors and that their kids were seldom ever seen. David continued to be very successful, at least when it came to his job. When it came to being a husband, though, some people said he was doing a eh, pretty subpar job. His supposedly strict religious convictions got more and more loose over time, and eventually David and Luis became swingers. God, I really feel for the couple that ended up with these two. This is when the case becomes, what people have said, extraordinary for numerous reasons. This is due to how long their crimes would take place, the gravity of what they inflicted upon their children, and how systematically callous it all was. In 1999, the whole family packed up and moved over to the nearby city of Rio Vista. It was here where the parents began to really distance themselves from the kids, moving them into an isolated trailer a ways away on the property. They allowed the two youngest children to live in the home with them, but they basically left all the other kids to fend for themselves. They would bring them groceries once in a while, usually on a weekly basis or so, but it was never enough to feed all of them when they did bring them. Somehow, David had gotten approval from the state to begin his own private school, which he called the Sandcastle Day School, that he simply ran out of his house. He appointed himself as the principal. From then on, the kids were, quote, homeschooled, and I use that term as lightly as possible. David continued working and was making a solid $140,000 a year. Louise had listed herself as being a homemaker. It seems that one of the daughters was allowed to attend classes at a school for a while, while none of the others were. When she attended this school, she was often bullied for wearing the exact same clothes every day and having a notably horrible smell. Jordan Turpin, one of the daughters, says that at the time, when she was about six years old, most of the kids were starving. They had resorted to eating ketchup packets, mustard packets, and ice cubes. The sad thing is, the police did come out to the house twice, and both times they failed to notice anything, and nothing came of it. In 2001, sheriff's deputies went over after one of the daughters was bit by a dog, but nothing ever came of it. Then again in 2003, the deputies went back once more after one of their pigs got out and ate 55 pounds of dog food from a neighbor's home, but again, nothing came of it. The mistreatment would go on to continue, and in 2012, David decided to retire. In turn, the family eventually moved out of this home as well, taking all of the kids with him to somewhere new, Paris, California. After they moved out, the neighbors, curious, prowled onto the property a bit. They found the home to be covered in feces, caked into all of the surfaces, basically, and creepily, they discovered bunk beds with ropes tied around them. Nearby, they found the bodies of dead cats among piles and piles of rotting garbage. After moving to California, the family's new neighbor stated that when they did see the kids, they were completely silent until spoken to, almost as if they were trying to remain invisible. Most of them didn't seem to really know how to walk properly, kind of skipping around instead. All of them appeared to be very pale and skinny to a concerning degree. Louise's sister says that David and Louise refused to ever let her meet the kids. Her older sister said that she had seen the kids and was definitely concerned about their weight. However, the pictures that the family posted on Facebook seemed to show them as one big, happy, nuclear family unit. This kind of quelled their suspicions for now. Louise, however, was starting to really worry one of her sisters. This sister said that as she got older, she was adopting more and more bad habits. This particular sister would go on to say about her lifestyle. She was drinking, smoking, partying, going to bars, practicing witchcraft, gambling, handling and eating rattlesnakes, dressing and acting vulgar on MySpace, into sex practices, and it goes on and on. I was really concerned for her. The mistreatment of the kids definitely did start back in the 90s in their Fort Worth home, but it was far from over. It didn't only continue up until this point, it actually got worse and worse. The house itself was filthy, to say the least. Trash bags filled the hallways, and huge amounts of unnecessary garbage littered every surface. It was definitely a hoarder house, to put it simply. Some rooms were so entirely filled with garbage that they were rendered completely unusable. 
The kids' rooms consisted of barrack-style wooden bunk beds with chains and handcuffs attached. Sometimes they were even restrained up in the closets instead, which were also fitted with chains and handcuffs. The floors and portions of the walls were completely caked in dust, dirt, and feces. All 13 of the kids rarely ever saw sunlight. They lived nocturnal lives, being up all night and going to sleep at about 4 a.m. Most of the time, food was strictly rationed out and they were only allowed to eat once per day. Not only that, but they rarely ever bathed whatsoever. They were allowed one single shower a year. They were held prisoner, their parents controlling every single aspect of their lives. They were so strict that they would be severely punished if they were caught washing their hands, as the parents called it, playing with water. They were also beaten, strangled, starved, and locked away, shackled to their own beds. They were restrained so much of the time that they were usually never allowed bathroom breaks for months at a time, leaving them no choice but to relieve themselves where they were. Their parents would buy toys for them, but even this was nefarious in nature. They would seemingly taunt the kids with them, never allowing them to take them out of the packaging, and certainly never allowing them to play with them. It's unknown if they did this purely to taunt the kids, or if buying these toys would somehow convince the neighbors and people around them that they were actually normal, loving parents. They would make nice meals and desserts for themselves, allowing the kids to see and smell them, but never allowing them to have any for themselves. They purely watched them starve in the corner as they sat and ate their lavish meals. It seems that one of the girls was even subjected to perverse acts from her father, although the extent of these acts is unclear. A lot of the kids were adults, but most people would have never expected them to be. They were so malnourished that they never got very big. The 29-year-old only weighed 82 pounds. The arms of the adults were the same circumference as an average four-year-old's. Many of them seemed to be so completely cut off from the world that they lacked any sort of common knowledge. They had no idea what police officers, doctors, or medicine even were. All of the children were born in a hospital, but pretty much none of them ever ended up seeing a doctor again after that point. One of the only things that the kids were allowed to actually do was write in journals, which they did pretty regularly as there was absolutely nothing else to do. This is where many of the details of what they experienced would be chronicled. It seems like, at some point, the oldest son in the family was allowed to take classes at a local community college. Louise would actually accompany him to the school, wait outside of his classrooms while he attended class, and immediately take him home afterwards. The family would sometimes go on little trips as a group that would do a pretty good job at convincing those around them that they were actually a very regular, albeit huge, loving family. Periodically, David and Louise would make a big event out of renewing their wedding vows, usually going to a Las Vegas chapel to do so. A lot of their kids actually did accompany them on these trips, and they would take big family photos that they would go on to post online. They all dressed in the same clothes, and a lot of them notably supported David's signature haircut. Sometime in 2012, they all went to Disneyland together and posted all of the pictures online. David and Louise had a pretty big infatuation with Disney. I guess they would be what people call now Disney adults. Again, on this trip, everyone was dressed alike and rocking that one haircut. This time, though, the youngest kid oddly wasn't with them. Later on, the family all took part in a community holiday celebration where they built a nativity scene in their front yard. This time, five of the kids attended an award ceremony with their parents in which prizes were given for the best decorations. In 2016, Louise's mother would go on to pass away, and in only three months, her father would pass away as well. In both of their last minutes, they asked Louise to come out to see them. She refused both times and didn't even show up at their funerals. Oddly enough, though, David attended both of them for some reason. In the background, while all of this was happening, two of the girls in the family began plotting their escape. In 2018, David and Louise started discussing moving the family yet again one more time, this time out to Oklahoma. The girls decided that they should make their move now, lest they risk getting locked up somewhere even worse. They made a break for it, escaping out of a window. The younger of the two, only 13 at the time, got spooked and decided to run back to the house. The older of the two, 17-year-old Jordan, wasn't ready to give up, though. She pressed on, got some distance away from the house, and called 911 on a cell phone that she had snuck with her. 
That cell phone had been deactivated, but the parents didn't take into account that you can still call 911 regardless of whether or not a phone is active, usually. She told the police that she and all of her siblings were being held prisoner by their parents and that they were being mistreated, to put it lightly. She said that the smell in the house was becoming so bad that she was having a hard time breathing. 911 emergency, what are you reporting? Um, hello? This is 911, do you have an emergency? Um, I just ran away from home. Do you know what street you're on? Um, no. Uh, I just ran away from home because I live in a family of 15, okay? Can you hear me? And we have abusing parents. Did you hear that? Okay, how did they abuse you? Okay, they hit us, they throw us across, they like throw us across the room. They pull our hair, they, they yank out our hair. I have two more. My two little sisters right now are chained up. What's your address? Okay, you got to give me a minute. It's going to take a while. I've never been out. I don't go out much, so I don't know anything about the streets or anything. The reason I ran away from home was because the chains were making places and they would wake up at night and they would start crying. And they wanted me to call somebody and tell them. And so... I wanted to call, I wanted to call y'all so y'all can help my sister. Do you think anybody in the house will need to go to the hospital? Uh, I'm not sure. Sometimes, we live in silt, and sometimes I wake up and I can't breathe because how dirty the house is. We never take baths. When was the last time you had a bath? Almost a year ago. Do you know what your dad's name Jesus is? Jesus Turpin. I don't know much about my mother. He doesn't like us. He doesn't spend time with us ever. Does anybody at the house take any kind of medication? Oh, uh, I don't know what medication any is. Any medicine? When we have a cold, sometimes we take rehabilitation. She brought some photos of the home as proof and showed them to the first officer who arrived. Needless to say, the officer was pretty shocked. Deputies from the Riverside County Sheriff's Department raided the house, saying that they were there on a welfare check. As the police waited at the door, David and Louise unshackled a few of the kids who were being chained up as fast as they could before answering the door. Both David and Louise came to the door together, seemingly confused as to why the cops would ever suspect them of anything. David protested a bit, asking if they had a warrant, but the deputies responded that they didn't need one under these circumstances. Shortly after entering and looking around, they stated, yep, detain the parents. Because you see, upon entering the house, they were greeted with a pretty horrific sight. Mold, rotten food, human feces, decaying animals, and mountains upon mountains of garbage. They came across the remaining 12 kids, some of whom had been shackled to their bed for weeks at that point. Two of the others had been set free just before the police showed up. The kids were frail, covered in dirt and grime, extremely weak, and covered in bruises. They were so small that the cops thought they were surely all minors, when the truth is that seven of them were over 18 years old at this point. Then they came across the journals, where they would finally read about the horrors these kids experienced for themselves. The only kid in the house that seemed to be relatively okay was the youngest, a two-year-old girl who seemed to have actually gotten enough to eat. Comparing this to the 29-year-old eldest daughter, who weighed 82 pounds, the difference was jarring. The parents were detained, arrested, and slapped with a myriad of charges. While being arrested, one of the officers mentioned a child in chains. Oh, is that what this is about? Replied Luis, seemingly in disbelief. 12 counts of torture, 12 counts of false imprisonment, 7 counts of abuse of a dependent adult, and 6 counts of child abuse. David got one additional charge, that of a lewd act on a child under 14. The bail was set at $9 million for Luis and $12 million for David. All of the children were sent to hospitals immediately due to severe malnutrition. Most of them were in there for several weeks. Uh, the doctors even assumed that they might go into shock if they were given too much nutrition too fast. Their bodies just weren't used to it. They were filled up with antibiotics, nutrients, and vitamins in the meantime. And needless to say, psychologists were brought in to check on them as well. 
the hospital staff had to treat all sorts of issues present throughout all of the kids. Heart damage due to malnutrition, neuropathy, cognitive impairments, you name it. The six minors were eventually sent to live in foster homes. They were set to continue seeing their psychologists. This case quickly became a national sensation in the news and soon even spread internationally as well. This case was unlike anything most people had ever seen or even heard of. David was eventually hit with perjury charges as well, given his claims that his children were all attending a private school when they were actually chained up in bedrooms and closets. Louise's attorneys put in a request for her to be placed into a diversion program for those with mental health problems due to getting diagnosed as having a personality disorder. The judge denied this request, saying that she posed a risk to the public. On June 21st of 2018, the judge formally declared that there was more than enough evidence to have David and Louise stand trial for their crimes, despite their claims of being not guilty. They would continue to rot away in jail as they awaited their trials. After presumably a lot of heavy-duty cleaning, the family home in Paris was put up on auction. It was doubtful to most that they would be able to sell it for much. Both David and Louise expressed fear that their children would testify in court, understandably as that would just instantly seal their fate. However, it was widely believed by others that having the children testify wasn't really necessary. There was already a mountain of evidence against them. And the kids had just, they'd been through enough, and it was decided that there was just no need, which they were all happy to hear. David and Louise were expected to get hit with life sentences for their crimes anyway. In February 22nd of 2019, David and Louise changed their not guilty pleas. Instead, they decided to plead guilty to one count of torture, three counts of willful child cruelty, four counts of false imprisonment, and six counts of cruelty to an adult dependent. Either way, it was expected that they would still get life without parole in the end anyhow. Then, on April 19th that year, it finally happened. Both were sentenced to life in prison. However, surprisingly, they were given a possibility of parole after 25 years. But this is only a mere possibility, and many doubt they'll ever actually see that parole due to the severity of what they have done. David was sent to Mule Creek State Prison and eventually transferred to the California State Prison, Corcoran, where he remains to this day. Louise was sent off to Central California Women's Facility. An investigation was soon taken place by ABC News Magazine 2020 in which they looked into where the children were now. It was reported that many of them were now being neglected by social services, with some of them being homeless and that none of them were able to use any of the thousands of dollars that had been donated to them. That money had been placed into a trust that was controlled by a public guardian. Joshua, one of the sons, said that he wasn't even allowed enough money from the trust to buy a bicycle. Jordan, the daughter who escaped, said that she was released from her foster home despite having no life skills, no place to live, no knowledge of how to feed herself, and no sort of health care. A private law firm was hired to look into what was, sad to say, even more neglect taking place against these kids. David's 81-year-old mother spoke out about all of this, oddly enough, saying, They were just like any ordinary family, and they had such good relationships. I'm not just saying this stuff. These kids, we were amazed. They were sweetie this and sweetie that to each other. I feel that they were model Christians. It's hard to believe all of this. Over the years, the Lord knows what happened. Louise's sisters came out and spoke about the case as well. They said they hadn't really seen her in 20 years, but they had talked on the phone from time to time. They said that they felt it was clear that David was treating Louise like a queen. We always thought she was living the perfect life, said one sister. She would tell us that they went to Disneyland all the time, that they would go to Vegas. However, they did know that it was very odd that they were never allowed to talk to the kids, but given, you know, their happy-go-lucky Facebook posts and all their nice-looking family photos, they figured, eh, it's probably nothing. Surprisingly, their home went on to sell for $310,360 in an online auction, about $40,000 under value, not bad given the circumstances. The new owner, when looking through the home, found all sorts of bottles of prescription medication and spoons filled with rotten food still caked onto them. She said that the house still reeked of poop and garbage. Uh, good luck to her, I guess. 
Luckily, it seems that all the kids are doing much better now, and they're actually on a path to getting a better life. They've recovered a lot, both physically and mentally. They may have lost their childhoods, but they're now free to enjoy their adulthoods, at least. I think it's incredible that anyone who grew up in that environment could go on to function at all, let alone have fairly normal adulthoods. While we're all here understandably disgusted by their parents, I think it's also important to look at this and be impressed by the kids. One of them has even since attended and graduated from college. The Riverside County Deputy District Attorney said about the kids, Some of them are living independently, living in their own apartments, and have jobs and are going to school. Some volunteer in the community. They go to church. I was very taken by them, by their optimism, by their hopes for the future, he said. They have a zest for life and huge smiles. I'm optimistic for them, and I think that's how they feel about their future. Once again, thank you for watching my video. Uh, this one was the darkest one that I've done in probably several weeks now. If you found it interesting, please give it a like. It really helps out with the algorithm. And if you find cases like this interesting, uh, feel free to subscribe. I talk about them quite a bit. It would be cool if you follow me on social media. Uh, if anything were ever to happen to the channel, that would be the only place I could ever say anything about it. And you know how YouTube goes. If you want to support the channel even further, I do have a Patreon account, which I keep linked down in the description below. And speaking of which, shout out to the top patrons. I don't know why I point this way, there's nothing over here. Anyway, shout out to the top patrons. Let us see who we have. We have L. Palmieri, Jim Bob Ghostkeeper, real name, Salad, Kevin, AMCMT, Rick from Work in Progress USA, Tang, Sass Johnson, Buttery Frankis, Wafrans, Jules Latona, Arctic Cat, Alan Damiani, Adrian Lawley, Marsh, Buffazerk, Rinsenstein, Kim Peek, Lux Alpaca, Charity, Scoochie Maine, Jackie, and Mark Barnett. You guys are all super, super good. Thank you, and good night.